Can you hear me? Pardon, you're supposed to stay at that point. Um, so hi, uh, my name is Mark Baker. I am not this person who is supposed to be delivering the presentation. So uh, Tom, unfortunately, was unable to make it. Um, so um, I'm doing, going to do my best to try and uh, cover for him. So, but we do work in the same team. Uh, and so aside from knowing many secrets about him, uh, hopefully I'll, uh, uh, and I have run through this with him, uh, so hopefully we should be able to do that. But it does mean you, you could probably catch me out with any tricky questions if you wanted to. And so the, uh, the subject of this is making the economics of OpenStack work. And so this is essentially a, uh, going to be a comparison between OpenStack and a well-known public cloud. You can guess which one it is. Um, and, and how it kind of stacks up and how I think uh, we can try and address it. Um, I work for Canonical, the company behind Ubuntu. You can probably guess that. Um, so this comes with a warning in that uh, most of the examples I will give are Ubuntu examples, and most of the tools that I will talk about are Ubuntu tools. So if any of you find that offensive, now is your opportunity to leave. Thank you for staying. So um, I will skip over Tom. Um, modern software is going through this change, right? And this is the change from enterprise software that was traditionally vertically scaled, horizontally, sorry, vertically integrated, um, a very tight coupling between application, operating system, and hardware. Um, and that, that has changed. And so now we're seeing software that is made up of very many different, often smaller components that are spaced across very many different machines. And so complex application architectures will contain very many different pieces that instead of running on one or two or a handful of machines actually are running on many more machines, right? And so and we'll see the different components that go to make up that application being striped across many, many servers. And this is kind of very typical of a scale-out implementation, right? The reason that we have scale-out software architectures are because we're having to deal with more, right? It doesn't matter whether it's more data, more users, uh, 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 more connections, but more. Right, and in um, Canonical, certainly, in the Ubuntu community, we call this big software, right? So in the age of big software. And uh, big software examples, things like um, Hadoop, which I'm sure uh, if you don't use, you certainly know of. Uh, uh, platform as a service technologies, Cloud Foundry, uh, or OpenShift, or Heroku, or all these kind of things, comprised of many components spread across uh, different platforms. And so OpenStack is big software. Um, there are 54 different OpenStack projects, right? So installing all of them, you can, you can do it on a single machine if you want, but it's very many different components that are related to very many other components, and in some sane architecture, you would have those spread across multiple machines, right? That creates um, a management challenge, shall we say, right? How do you manage that? How do you manage, how do you deploy that environment? How do you manage that environment? So. Um, what we see is, is with big software and with this move to scale out, we see um, this kind of push and pull. So as we get more scale, we have to disaggregate, right? Split things into multiple units. And as we disaggregate, we get more scale, right? And to kind of explain that, we take a telco uh, example. Anyone from telco? Hey. So, hi, telco people. So, um, in a typical telco environment, and I could have picked on any um, uh, uh, NEP, but in a typical telco environment, we're used to providing services like uh, whatever, packet core, or IMS, or phone connectivity things, should we say? And they would go and buy that from a vendor like Ericsson, or Alcatel, Lucent, or Nokia, or Huawei, or one of the others. And that would come as a big, fancy box that would do those things. And they'd do it extremely well. The inner workings of that box were kind of a mystery to people that didn't work at the vendor that provided that, but it didn't matter because it did exactly what it was required to and did it really well. Um, but also expensive, right? Reassuringly expensive to steal Stella Artois uh, marketing line, right? And so as telcos are looking for different options, this move to NFV, and of course, you know, you'll hear all about that tomorrow on the NFV track if you don't know about it already, 
Um, you see that that is moving to standard industry hardware, for want of a better word, common off-the-shelf hardware, using Ubuntu example, of course, but using uh, 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 Linux-based operating system. Could be CentOS or Red Hat or SUSE or a different one, of course. Um, sometimes with OpenStack, sometimes with a, a LexD is our container hypervisor, sometimes with VMware. Um, then, you know, again, another operating system above the line, and then a series of VNS, which is fancy telco speak for application, right? And that VNF could be a firewall or could be some, you know, messaging service or load balancing service or a whole bunch of different things. Um, so that's disaggregation, disaggregating a service. And that is big software, right? That NFV service is big software. There's many different components that we have to try and manage, that we have to try and scale. The same is true in, in enterprise, right, where we see um, a traditional enterprise stack, good enterprise quality, you know, HP has it built into their, built into their name. Uh, likewise, Red Hat, Oracle, of course, SAP, the kind of big industry heavyweights of enterprise software. We see that being disaggregated. Uh, come on. There we go, in exactly the same way. Uh, in the, oh good, Ubuntu CentOS example, but sometimes with OpenStack, sometimes with VMware, sometimes with containers increasingly. Oh, there we go, finally. Um, but then with guest operating systems, could be Ubuntu, could be Windows, could be an enterprise Linux of your choice, uh, and then other applications, right? Some nice data analytics examples there, Hadoop and Spark, MySQL, SAP, right? So disaggregation, many more moving parts to manage. It doesn't mean that the SAP Oracle environment there over on the left, it's easy to manage, of course, that has its own challenges too. But you know, typically those vendors have great management tools, so things like operations and backups and upgrades and those things are handled pretty well. Whereas on this side, the potential is very many different ways of managing them, right? Upgrading, updating, all those problems. So enterprises have this disaggregation they end up moving towards big software. They do for good reasons. They want flexibility, they want scale, they want other things, right? Um, so economics and operations. If we take, I didn't pick a, pull out any examples, but take vendor A, vendor B, vendor C as sort of typical enterprise software vendors. So the builds are really slow on this, so I don't know why. Um, that is the traditional, traditional enterprise way of doing things. And prior to these guys arriving on the uh, right-hand side, that was the, the way of, of delivering infrastructure, right? And businesses typically kind of sucked up the cost of that. This is what it's gonna to cost to deliver my infrastructure and therefore, and they'd kind of tweak around the edges. You know, the great Unix to Linux migration in the early 2000s, which I was proud to be a part of when I was at Red Hat, was great. That cut out some cost and gave some flexibility, right? But that, the general way of doing things was accepted and, and uh, until Amazon came along in roughly 2007, 2008, and then more likely Azure, because Amazon's so successful, Microsoft, hey, hey get in that game, off they go. Um, suddenly, you saw that actually there's a much more cost-efficient way of delivering infrastructure, right? And I think that if OpenStack needs to succeed, its comparison point isn't over on the left with the traditional enterprise way, right? You should be able to do OpenStack or more cost-effectively than traditional big enterprise software. Its comparison point actually are the public cloud vendors, right? Just like gravity, it's very hard to defy the laws of economics, right? And workloads will naturally go where the infrastructure is the most cost-effective, certainly in any sane business, right? And so, um, really, to be able to deliver that across that environment, OpenStack needs to be cost-competitive with those public cloud vendors, and actually, because we live in a hybrid world, right? Nobody's going to go all in. Very few people are going to go all in on one model or another. They're going to have on-premise and they're going to have public use. You need some kind of marketplace and commonality of operations, right? So here are some numbers. Your mileage may, va may vary, and these numbers are gonna, not going to stand scrutiny of the finest analysts in the world, right? Other oh, fan taking pictures. The, um, the numbers came, by the way, by and large, from uh, some OEM hardware vendor websites and uh, the Amazon TCO calculator, right? 
very useful for putting these things together. So take in terms of CapEx server hardware based upon um, uh, 25 servers. This is a kind of uh, a mythical application, but 25 uh, servers. We're needing a uh, load of hardware that we need to buy, some networking, top of rack switches. So we're looking at a couple of racks, some uh, top of rack switches, some power units, some storage that we're going to need as well, and some software, right? And take that software number is going to be for roughly 25 nodes of OpenStack from vendor of your choice, right? No, I know different vendors have different pricing models and different means of doing it, but that's sort of roughly $500 per server per year, right? So total capex around that, that number, 236. Um, and then the operational uh, expenditure. We've got maintenance, power, and space values. These, by and large, come from, as I say, the Amazon TCO calculator. Comparison point, it's probably biased, right? So as I say, it's not going to stand scrutiny, but as an indicator, uh, roughly around that. Right? Seem fair? Anything missing? People, right. So who's hiring OpenStack? No one? Right? I mean, this is a big job fair, right, to a large extent. A lot of people shuffling between different companies. Um, and um, uh, and it's, you know, it's a good time to be an OpenStack engineer. Uh, supposedly. So uh, if we look at the national, this is coming from Indeed.com, uh, salary trends, average OpenStack engineer uh, is being paid in the region of about $170,000 a year, right? I don't actually know if that's fair or not. I work in the UK, it's a different market. But supposedly. Um, so once we add that in, if you think for our 25 server OpenStack cloud, we're probably looking at two engineers Right, to build that, manage it, and maintain it. So add in that cost, we're looking at over a, over a million dollars over a three-year period for those two people, assuming they don't get pay rises in the meantime, and that would be optimistic over that three-year period. So it's quite a chunk of money. If we look at public cloud, this is AWS, even though it doesn't list it, but it's AWS. Um, 25 of their large instances, plus some storage, plus AWS support, right? so somebody we can call. Um, and uh, one person over three years, you can argue whether that's fair or not, but $450,000. So um, that comparison point, 1.58, just under $1.6 million for over a three-year period versus $820,000, right? Quite a, quite a difference. So where, given the choice, where do you think you put your workloads, right? What are you going to do? Um, so how do we get those costs down? How do we address that? So um, first up is look at the model that people are using, right, to deploy their OpenStack. This is from the latest OpenStack survey. Most people are using uh, unmodified packages from the operating system, right? So it can be Red Hat, SUSE, Ubuntu, whatever, or unmodified packages from a vendor distribution. So they'll be using a vendor distribution of OpenStack, Rant OpenStack, or RDO, or whatever it is, right? right? That's going to be a little less labor intensive than modifying packages or building them yourself, right? But that's only one piece, right? Because that may help you get it deployed, but what we really need is the operations piece, right? Because it's those people that are expensive. So we need to, we need to get to a place where we have fewer people. And how do we do that? Well, the open source way is to, is to crowdsource operations, right? It's to crowdsource, get skills, reuse. Um, and we need reusable operations that we can all benefit from. So reuse requires some kind of encapsulation. Right? Packaging is a good example of encapsulation. So encapsulation requires a model. We need to be able to model how our services fit together. It's a very simple example of, of how we might model an OpenStack. We've got you know, Nova Swift, Glance, Keystone, Horizon. Um, this is not a 100% accurate model, right? But just an example, we have these things connect together. Right, to be able to reuse. Um, Ubuntu has a tool called Juju, and we do exactly that, where we model different services together. This is a, a an example of what we call a bundle. Each one of these services, you can hopefully rec you can recognize Rabbit um, and the and the Ceph as services. These are applications. We define what that application service is. It's in, in something called a charm. These are a bunch of services that we have modeled on our nice little GUI environment. And we say, OK, Ceph connects to 
uh, uh, whatever it is, Keystone, and, and Rabbit connects to MySQL, and, and Horizon connects to uh, Nova, et cetera, right? And we say these are the relationships between them. We collect those charms, these services, up into a bundle, and we can share these things. I can share an individual, individual service, the definition of a service, uh, with you. I can share the definition of a bundle, what that looks like. So this is relatively simple. It's just pretty much OpenStack core with Ceph on the side. Right, but it gives us a model, and actually it gives us a means to be able to share that model. So uh, as I said, these things are charms. Charms defines, a charm is essentially, it's analogous to like a, a chef recipe or a puppet manifest or something like that. Um, but uh, charms declare an interface. So we take a, this really simple example, uh, MySQL and Rabbit. We can have um, MySQL has a set of interfaces, like uh, 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 you know, things that it can connect to, essentially. Um, it, uh, DB slave, for example, if we're in, in a sort of master slave environment, syslog, because we want to be able to log to syslog centrally, et cetera. And likewise, rabbit. But you'll see one of these we define as MySQL, it has its interface that says, I provide MySQL. Uh, rabbit has an interface that says, I consume. This is how I consume MySQL. So that when we add a relationship between the two, it knows what to do, right? Um, that's adding a relationship. Um, we also need to be able to, to exp tell the service what to do when things happen, right? And we, in, in Juju, we call these event handlers. So, for example, when we add a relation or we remove a relation, what happens, right? Do we need to create tables? Do we need to drop tables, for example? Uh, and likewise on the rabbit side, right? These things have to be expressed. So you can see, actually, reasonably quickly, a charm can be quite a complex thing, right? Which is why crowdsourcing them and getting people to, de de to develop them is a good thing. We do a lot of the work on the, a lot of the base level charms, uh, we being Ubuntu Canonical. So all of the OpenStack stuff, all of the common, very common uh, open source applications, uh, we've done a lot of the, the heavy lifting on that. But we also get great community contribution from people also defining this is how uh, we can add you know, relationships between Media Wiki or whatever it is, OpenStack Project X, right? New OpenStack Projects. Um, this model allows us to be able to define sort of complex t topologies. And given that OpenStack is a complex t topology, we can see a number of these different services that we have running together. We define what the relationships are. We have the, uh, the charms uh, uh, expose those relationships uh, and run events or the hooks when we want to do certain things. Um, this modeling approach allows us to be able to model scale. So um, because uh, we have the messaging server on one side and we have the, the database server on the other side, if we've just got a one-to-one, -one, we've got one unit of each and we have a relationship between them, that's fine. But when we start to add more units of the service, it knows what to do, right? Because the relationship the event handling is defined. So add another 10 units of MySQL. It's relative, it doesn't, we don't need to go and fire, do things manually to be able to add config. Oh, well, now I've got 10 units. How do I connect that to the, to the rabbit, right? It's all defined within the charm. It means adding 10 units is just uh, did you add unit n equals 10, and off it goes. Boom, boom, boom. I forgot about the fancy build. Um, so operations. Modeling is fine. This, by the way, is, is independent of OpenStack, so we model on, on different platforms, AWS and others. But modeling is, um, is only part of the problem. Deployment is only part of the problem. It's operations. And so um, being able to operate, and say, it's, if we want to have fewer people managing our environment, we need to be able to operate more efficiently. That means we need to be able to do some of the hard things in OpenStack. So the model alert gets us to define and build the environment, but there are certain things that we need to be able to do as part of our, uh, uh, our operations. So typically, there's a lot of raw materials that we can put into a charm. There's a lot of expertise, for example, out there. People have defined great ways of doing things in Puppet or Chef or Ansible, and we can pull those into uh, a charm, uh, but obviously, you know, tables and zip files and all sorts of different things, uh, Docker images even. And then there's, we can define these as operations. So if we want to upgrade, take an example, well, install, of course, or remove, yep. But if we want to upgrade, what are the steps and the things that we need to do as part of that? 
So all backup or benchmark. These things on your right-hand side, uh, we define as, as actions. So as part of the charm, you can define that as an action. Um, so actions are also encoded as hooks. So we can say, you know, back up a database uh, uh, or clean out a database. We can benchmark it. We can flush cache. We can reset logs. We can do all of those things. Right? So it's, it's like an automated operation. If I want to back up my environment, I will just run a single juju command to back that up. Those in operations are encapsulated to do a number of different things. Uh, let's, if we focus on upgrades and updates, for example, this is the, the charm for Horizon. Um, and you'll see defined as part of that, we have a number of actions. One of those actions you can see is OpenStack upgrade. So to upgrade that environment, we can either click on the fancy GUI and select the upgrade option or via command line typically uh, upgrade that. And it means that upgrading from one version of Horizon to a new one becomes very easy. Exactly what happens when I click upgrade is, defi sorry, is defined in here. And what we really want to do is to get people, we, the community, to input on the best way of doing that. We have a lot of people using this in production, you know, some big telcos even, and they are feeding into this in terms of, okay, this is how we upgrade, or this is how we apply security profiles, or this is how we uh, back these things up. That makes for more efficient operations for everybody. And whilst you can share puppet uh, manifests or chef recipes and things like that, um, we maintain a central repository of the charms that were vetted and fed into by a wide community. Okay, let me skip through that. So let's, if we, let's look at how we can start to um, reduce some of that. Did I skip a slide there? It's for whatever reason, it's not showing. So how do we bring these, bring these costs down? Well, um, if we start to uh, um, look at a slightly different model, yes, we've still got the server hardware, we've still got the top of rack switch, we've got a PDU, um, but through using this tooling, we can actually reduce the number of people, right? So instead of having two, we have one person to manage the environment, actually we can cut the cost down significantly. And notice I've cut the storage cost as well, because one of the things that we can do, one of the charm bundles, for example, that we have for OpenStack, uses a hyper-converged architecture where we're spreading disk across Nova, we're combining storage with compute. Piston used to do this, if you're familiar with Piston's architecture. So, um, and that can lead to some efficiency, right? Fewer servers required, right? So no dedicated uh, storage. So we can cut some of that storage cost out of course, you still need the disks, but reduce some of the capex, reduce some of the opex, and that gets us down towards you know still still got the same public cloud costs. Um, so we can cut it down, chop some of that cost out, right? One fewer people. But we're still is that going to be enough? I don't know. We, let's so we take a slightly different approach. Um, there are a number of different vendors that offer fully managed services, right? Fully managed on-premise OpenStack. And I think below a certain level, this, this makes real sense. So these are a bunch of canonical offers this as a service. Uh, so these are numbers are based on that. But yes, you're still going to need the hardware. Same networking environment, same, same uh, uh, environment. Um, and so your CapEx is by and large the same. But now we have a fully managed OpenStack environment. Canonical charges $15 per server per day to do this. So you can kind of work out the maths over three years. Um, OpEx now drops down a chunk more. So whilst we're not, in this instance, AWS is still going to be slightly cheaper, based on my, or Tom's, I should say, back of the napkin maths, um, it's much closer. It's, it, we're now in a similar ballpark, right? And gentlemen who put their hands up saying work for telcos probably aren't paying retail on their servers, right? So you could probably get pretty close. And then a lot of the values are running you know, in-house versus in public, data sovereignty and all those things, all those good reasons start to really come into play, right? Especially as, of course, there's a lot of sunk cost there already anyway. So I think it's pretty close, but the, you know, to try and sort of summarize, I don't know how I am on time, but try and summarize, I think that OpenStack can get closer, right? It needs to get closer to, to the operating cost of a public cloud um, because it's very hard to defy the laws of economics, right? Workloads will go to the most cost-efficient places. Um, and in order to do that, we need to treat OpenStack like big software, and big software requires a different model, right? Using the tools that we had, I was gonna say 10 years ago, but even five years ago, 
to model these big complex environments, to, to manage these big complex environments, isn't going to work. So curation uh, and tooling approaches or managed services even can help us get a lot closer to that kind of cost equity equivalence. I think that was it. It was, yes. So does anyone have any, uh, any questions? If you do, you can either come up to the mic and ask or um, shout it out and I'll repeat it. No questions? All right, well, thank you very much.